we are going to talk about the early history of the British Isles. And the subtitle from prehistory to Norman conquest sounds very fancy, but in fact, all it says is that we will start at the earliest period that we know something about, and then we will finish before the Normans arrive. The Normans will actually arrive next week. Um, which also says that, by the way, a large part of this presentation is going to be not very specific and not very concrete, because a large part of this is before written culture. So some of it is absolutely before written culture, and the rest of it is maybe not necessarily before written culture, but at least before the Brit people on the British Isles started to write. So um, a lot of it will be presenting guesswork, really. Um, but I try to make sure that at least some of it is tangible, factual, so we will mostly talk about buildings and old artifacts, swords, um, decorative items, you know, all these things. So what we, we will know what they have, and then I will tell you what we think they are, but of course, we only think. Sure, there are archaeologists working those, those things, so they have a lot of um, research going into that, but still. Anyway, the first thing I would like to point out for you is that there is a periodization here, and there is going to be another one later on during my presentation. This is very useful because once you open the textbook, you will see that the textbook, while very readable, very user-friendly, but it's almost like a fairy tale. It just tells you the story, and this happened, and that happened, and so on. And the dates are going to be there, and the periods are going to be there, but hidden in the, in the narrative. So um, one way to orient yourself in the readings will be to use this periodization. Um, at the very end of your textbook, there is also a periodization, but that's um, so that you can use that too. Anyway, so today we are going to talk about quite a lot of periods. The Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. Um, these are the parts where I said, well, you know, we don't really have too much or any uh, written um, documentation of that. No chronicles by the um, by prehistoric men. Um, it gets better from the British, I mean, the Roman period. Um, but then again, we also have some uncertainties. So if you look at it, for example, everything up to here, 11,000, 1,700, 2,100, 750, these are obviously too nicely round. The reason they are too nicely round is because we don't know exactly. We are happy that we can say that it is roughly at that time. Um, until this. This is an actual year. What year? Anybody knows? 43? It's in the title of the period. <laughs> Not really. The Roman Empire is much older, but the Roman colony in Britain. So that's the Roman conquest. Yes. So we know that it was exactly in 43 that the Romans came and occupied the majority of the British Isles, not all of it. Um, yes, but isn't this suspicious? 
logically thinking, isn't this extremely suspicious? Like the Iron Age suddenly ends because the Romans come. Doesn't sound, that just doesn't sound believable, does it? No. And of course, if you said, no, it doesn't, you would be completely right. It's not really like that. So the Iron Age in Britain uh, probably ended around 100, 110, something like that. Uh, so even at that point, there were still people living uh, in the traditional way of the Iron Age. But at the same time, of course, there were also the Romans who were already an advanced civilization. So what we have in the period between the Romans appearing and the last Iron Age people dying out <laughs> is basically a coexistence. Or uh, their life adapting to the Roman conditions. Um, also, another thing, these dates even might not be what you would find in every uh, textbook. If you actually study history or uh, civics, you might have learned about these periods and had different times. The reason for that is, is that Britain then and Britain now is, of course, a civilization based on islands, so relatively isolated. So certain periods in Britain appear later than they would appear elsewhere, um, especially in those early periods. Okay. Um, now, um, we will talk about the others later. This is also a very specific date, of course, and as I said, that's the Norman uh, conquest. Anglo-Saxons don't disappear. Anglo-Saxons are just forced to assimilate. Okay, so let's start talking about the first period, Neolithic Britain. Now, Neolithic Britain um, is the earliest period we can really talk about in the history of the British Isles. And you are saying, okay, so what about the Paleolithic and all that? It doesn't mean there were no people living um, in Britain at those periods. What it means is that we just don't have enough things remaining from that period to even talk about it. Um, and as you will find out, <laughs> we don't have much from this either. So, you know, like what we are talking about are a place like Stonehenge, impressive, fancy, a tourist trap, but what is it? Well, nobody really knows. There are various theories, but nobody really knows. Uh, Scarabray, at least we know what it is, and you will find out why I'm so convinced about that. Um, and besides these two relatively well-kept relatively majestic sites, most of the things that we have are a grave or two here and there, and what they found in the graves. So before that, we didn't have that much. Okay, so Stonehenge, obviously everybody knows Stonehenge, right? You cannot actually exist without having heard and seen something about Stonehenge. Not because you were in Britain, but because uh, it's guaranteed that in some TV series or film or something, somebody is just going to go to Stonehenge in any kind. It can be Asterix and Obelix going there and accidentally ruining it. It can be um, somebody else going there and accidentally ruining it. It's actually the most typical thing about Stonehenge is that some stupid tourists just push it and it all collapses. Uh, it's not that easy. <laughs> Those are really, really huge pieces of stone. I mean, come on, uh, 3000 BC to 2000 BC, uh, they are still there. If all the wars 
and all the people hungry for free stone to build from couldn't <laughs> destroy it, then tourists won't either. It's just too big, too solid, all that. Uh, by the way, when we say between 3000 and 2000 BC, now usually the reason we are so uncertain is simply because we just don't know, but here is not uncertainty. I mean, to some extent it is. But in fact, there is some evi evidence about Stonehenge that it indeed took an extremely long time and in fact several generations and generations and generations may have built it. So there are various parts from various periods. Um, okay, so what do we know? We have two circles of standing stones and some of them have lintels on them, so stones which are actually uh, horizontal and not standing. We guess that probably there were more lintels on them, not that we know, but it, it's, we guess. And um, another thing that we can say for sure is that it has a particular orientation. So, um, at the summer solstice, what is the solstice? There is a winter solstice and a summer solstice, twice a year. Then the length of the night and the length of the day is the same, exactly the same length. And then it gets, one of them gets longer and the other one gets <laughs> shorter. So um, at the summer solstice, the sun actually comes up and goes down exactly in a beautiful part of the Stonehenge. So that's what we know. That's wonderful, but what does this mean? Some theorists say, of course, this must be a place for rituals. The reason they did it is because they probably had very bloody sacrifices there. Druids. Oh. The Druids were actually much later, so maybe the Druids did that, but they were not the ones who built it. So if they did that, they did it later, and maybe they didn't know what the place was for anyway. Um, another possibility, yes, the sun is also important, and the stars are also important for calendars, so maybe this was a place for making calendars, you know, or not. Maybe they were playing football there, <laughs> for all we know. Football, theoretically, is a later invention, much later. But then again, we don't have written evidence, so it could just as well uh, be that. Look, this is what we are talking about, you know, so. It's usually not from this angle that you see it, because from this angle it looks a bit more broken than <laughs> from the angle they like to show it in films. But um, yeah, that's the whole thing. So you can see the outer circle and the inner circle, huge slabs of stones. Oh, and by the way, types of stones which are not present in the area. So they are not local stones. They had to bring it there from far away, which is even more crazy about this. Okay, but let's talk about Karabre now. Who has heard about Karabre? Hands up. One person, good. Were you in Scotland? No, I have studied art. So ah, okay, yeah. So, anyway, one way you hear about it is you study art or, or architecture. Another way, if you are in Scotland and more particularly at, on the Orkneys, because one of the Orkney Islands is where it is. Uh, a third way is that you hear it here. Uh, anyway, so um, this is a wonderful place. It's a Neolithic village which is relatively well preserved. So you can actually see uh, Neolithic huts or little houses uh, made of stone, and not just that, but in some cases, even 
um, some furniture from the period. You will see it in a second. And it is older than Stonehenge, but it is in a much better shape. And, um, and it's even older than the pyramids in Giza. Come on. Excellent, isn't it? So let's look at this. This is what we are talking about. So these kind of huts made of stone, and we guess that probably they had roof, the roof made of some kind of wood or leaves or whatever, so um, this is why we don't have them. Um, and inside, this is the other picture, is the inside of one of those huts, and as you can see, very nice furniture here. I mean, okay, this is all made of stone. It like, looks like we are talking about the Flintstones or something, but hey, this is that period, except for the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and people never lived in the same time, you know, very much not. But <laughs> other than that, um, it is surprisingly modern. It is surprisingly advanced. Um, they also found other utensils and so on. It's actually a nice thing to go there. Um, probably, well, there are probably two reasons this survived it so well. One of them is that, that this is <laughs> actually on the Orkney Islands. Uh, where are those? I already said it. Just pay attention to what I said. <laughs> Which part of Britain? Scotland, yes. But even in Scotland, we are talking about very, very, very much north and islands. So maybe one of the reasons it survived is that it wasn't exactly the highway of armies in most of history. So it was just too far away, too small, too bad weather, all of that. Um, but most importantly, the word Bray means a hill. And that's exactly what happened. You know that they called it a hill because it was a hill. There was a hill. And then once there was a huge, huge, huge storm and the earth was washed away, and then they found out that what looked like a hill were actually these huts. So, you know, for a long time it was underground, and they found it accidentally. Um, and the other thing is it was really far away in the north. Okay. So let's make a big jump. We are going really fast today. And let's talk about Bronze Age Britain. Now, I'm sorry for people who study art, because I'm going to again talk about very basic things, but <laughs> when you hear the Bronze Age, let's not imagine that everything they had was made of bronze. Not at all. In fact, um, it was not yet at the beginning of the Bronze Age that they were even able to make bronze. At first, they used to have most of their things which were not made of leather and stone and wood, uh, out of copper. Because copper, what is the big advantage of copper over bronze? Technologically speaking. It's more well, yeah, but also you don't have to make it. It exists out there, it's an ore. So, you know, like, they find the copper somehow, dig it out, hey, it's in, or just somewhere actually was possible at that time still to find it, you know, normally on the ground. It's like, hey, this is interesting. It's possible to hit it, and then it gets a form, and we can make something out of it. So it is available, whereas bronze has to be minted. You have to combine, actually, different metals. And you need heat and know-how and, you know, so 
um, bronze has to be made. So that's why actually the Bronze Age is considered very uh, advanced compared to earlier periods that, that they were able to mint a composite out of different metals. Um, but um, they actually didn't like so much or at all <laughs> the kind of inhabit uh, kind of uh, settlements like the Neolithic people did. So not all of those stones all around the place and making everything out of stone. Quite the opposite. They preferred wooden hats and embankments made of earth, which is understandable. You know, it's easier, um, faster to build something out of wood. It's also more um, it's, e it's less uh, resource intensive. The problem, of course, again, is that wood is very practical for them. Wood is very bad for archaeologists because, of course, wood doesn't survive thousands of years easily. So whereas at, with the Neolithic, at least we have places like Scarabray and, and Stonehenge and quite a few other places actually just not so complete or not so famous. Here it's a bit more problematic, uh, but there are a few places I would like to show you. The first is the Must Farm Settlement, and this is not an auxiliary here. So it's not that it's a settlement that you must farm, but uh, Must, Oxborough, Rillaton, and Mould are all places in Britain. So these things are named after the places where they found them or where they are. So let's take a look at the Must Farm Settlement. And you are going to say, oh, this is it? Well, this is it, yes. Um, and what you are going to, what do you see even there? What is this? What are those black, brown things all around the place? That's wood. That's all wood, actually. Uh, and these are actually a bit better. These are the luckier parts, because here the wood is still standing. And this is like already sort of. Um, and um, this is why we have them. Uh, these were, although these were in water, a river used to be here, but actually um, the peat in the um, area just preserved them. So, and then the river dry, uh, drew out, and then they, the layers and layers of things got on it, and of course they found this accidentally too. So I will show you what this looked like, probably. That's what the archaeologists think, is that those posts that you could see were in the river, really put down, down, very much down, and then they built huts on these above the water, and they were fishing uh, from these as well as living uh, in them. So this is what we know. I'm, obviously, you shouldn't imagine that all Bronze Age people in Britain were living on huts in the middle of the river fishing? Obviously not. But the others were not so lucky as to survive. So, um, okay, now. Another thing that survived, the Oxborough Dirk. And if you don't know what is a Dirk, then if I want to be really nasty, I'm going to tell you, well, don't you see, this is a dirk. <laughs> the dirk is a type of sword, um, but fine enough. But then again, if you look at this one, and I will tell you that it is 90, 90 centimeters long approximately, and two kilos heavy approximately, and rather thick, then you will also say, well, fighting with this would have not been too good because they didn't. 
So yes, this is a sword, but this is not a sword for fighting. It doesn't even have a good holder. It is too thick, it's too rigid, it's too everything. Um, and at this point, when you see something that looks like a sword, but at the same time is almost impossible to use as a sword, what does an archaeologist say? What is this for? Ritual purposes. Because everything that is impractical and we don't know what it is for, it's always for ritual purposes. So it's probably for ritual purposes or not. Or maybe it was part of a fence, but you know, who knows? But they think it was for ritual purposes. And they could also already work metal. So we have this wonderful Bronze Age gold cup. If you're saying it looks pretty basic, well, yeah, but this is a long time ago. And also, this is the Bronze Age. We think gold is exclusive and expensive and fancy, but they <laughs> might have not. They just thought, ah, this looks like copper, it's a bit more yellow, and it's, very, it's even easier to make this thing out of it. Because, ah, I forgot to, to attach the photo of, um, of the malt cape, but Google malt cape. Malt cape is also gold, but is extremely finely decorated. So they could in the period also do finely decorated stuff out of gold, but they didn't always want to. Okay, how are we with time? This is 45, excellent timing. Now is the time for our break. Iron Age Britain, which is even closer to the present day. Still far, but closer. Um, now, by the time of the Iron Age, um, there are already, I mean, the British Isles are much more um, heavily populated than before. And because of this, there are also more groups of people who don't necessarily agree with each other, meaning that there is much more armed conflict going on uh, on the Isles than before. Uh, there are more and more um, conflicts, and because of that, the wooden houses of the Bronze Age are no longer a good idea. Again, they have to make more massive houses, even if it is more difficult, if it's more painful, if it takes more time, if it requires more resources, and not only just houses, but even some kind of fortresses and walls to protect themselves. And because of this, what we can find in the from remaining from the period are of fortified, fortified farmsteads, which is interesting, you know, this is a concept which is a bit unfamiliar to us, a fortified farm, a farm fortress, <laughs> you want. Um, and hill forts and brochs. Hill forts are what the English area, of course we cannot really talk about English people and Scots at this point, but what the territory of present day England uh, most typically had in this period were hill forts, and the territory of the present day Scotland, what we find instead are brochs. And brochs are also fortresses, but not made of <coughs> ground, but made of stones. So in fact, those are probably more efficient, but also you need a lot of stones to build them. Whereas for uh, hill forts, you only need to dig and eventually you will have a fort. So, um, 
And you will be surprised, but doesn't this sound beautiful? Maiden castle, it's so poetical, it's so romantic, it's so medieval. Yes, but first, again, maiden here is not referring to a young lady, but to the place. And by castle, we mean this. Yes, beautiful, isn't it? Uh, the reason we see this from a photo made from an airplane is because this is what it is, a hill with circular uh, holes and then, then actually walls made out of the ground. So um, the photo is quite old. Was, they took this photo in 1935, but obviously this place didn't change much in the meanwhile, so, you know. Um, so compared to this, the Nesovburgi uh, fort is l much more advanced, don't you think? I mean, still not Roman architecture, but hey, this is at least made of stones. It looks like it would survive something. But also, this might be the reason why this is made of stone. We are talking about Scottish weather, and if you look at it, it's next to the sea. So, you know, huge waves would wash away your hill fort. They wouldn't wash away the stone fort if there is a big storm. So. Maybe the main reason they built it from out of stone is because they had to, and not because they necessarily were technologically more advanced. But maybe they were. Okay, so Roman Britain, hooray. The Romans are here. And um, this is quite unbelievable if you think about this. You probably have seen some movies showing you the Roman Empire. Now, obviously, those are movies, so there is a lot of fancy effects and all that, and a bit more fights than necessary. But anyway, they are not completely bad in terms of how they portray Roman Britain. So Roman Britain, of course, means cities, aqueducts, um, bath, huge temples, serious military fortifications. So these people that you just recall meet not even this, but this. So if you are asking how did it happen that the Romans conquered most of Britain in one year, this is how. I mean, you know, it's like two different, uh, completely different levels of civilization clashing. So anyway, so of course what this meant was they, that they brought Latin to Britain and this will be important for purposes of linguistics. So up to this point, all the people living in Britain were speaking various Celtic languages. Uh, but the Romans, of course, speak Latin. So um, a lot of the local inhabitants actually cooperated with the Romans, actually worked for them uh, moved to the cities, some of the, which is not surprising because uh, this is 40, um, 43 is not the first time the Romans appeared. They were there before twice, but just more like visiting. And the other thing is, is that they have had trade with parts of Britain already before that. So they were not unknown to each other. But when they came, they actually brought their own civilization. And civilization here also means 
a lot of clerks, administrative workers, um, merchants, crafts, and so on. And some came over, some were trained by the Romans. So obviously, because of this, Latin was a language that a larger and larger part of the population was speaking, and it even influenced the Celtic languages that were there. Okay, so, there are four main things that are important from the period. Two walls, Hadrian's Wall and Antonin, the Antonin Wall. Uh, Hadrian's Wall is the more famous. The Antonin Wall was the more courageous. And then, we are also going to talk about some Roman baths and further things that they built were various villas and forts. Now, the villas and forts you cannot really visit anymore. Most of those have been taken apart a long, long time ago and they do not survive intact. However, uh, many of those villas, while they were standing, were really um, luxurious. And luxurious villas in those periods didn't mean air conditioning, because they didn't invent it. It didn't mean jacuzzis, baths maybe, but not jacuzzis. But what it meant was mosaics. So those villas, of course, had a lot of interesting Roman mosaics. And those, many of those did survive. They are just no longer in the villas, but in various museums. Most of them in the British Museum, but not only. All kind of regional museums as well. Um, okay, so these are the two walls we are talking about. Adrian's Wall, which was, which where the building started in 122, and the Antonin Wall, where um, they already reached the south of present-day Scotland. And of course, the, even the south of Scotland is in the north. So, um, but they couldn't keep the Antonin Wall for very long. So they eventually ended up moving behind the Hadrian Wall again. Why, what, and it's going to be a very obvious and stupid question, so don't be afraid to answer it. Um, why do you think these walls were made for? What for? What was the purpose? Why would you want to build a wall? Why did the Chinese build a wall? Exactly. Ex yes, 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 yes. And you wouldn't be bad when you said the Vikings. I mean, not really the Viking Vikings but those that used to be Vikings, uh, so the Picts. Um, who are more or less the, one of the many ancestors of the Scots these days, but um, yeah, so. What the Romans occupied and conquered was Wales and England for sure, I mean, Wales these days and England these days, uh, but they couldn't really take the north. Those, for two reasons. One, extremely warlike people up there, much more than down. And second, well, far away, bad terrain and bad weather. So, by the way, Hadrian's Wall. This is, um, this used to be higher. Like obviously, this would not keep the warlike Picts out of the Roman part if it was just like this. So this used to be a bit more majestic than that. But these days, the part in the picture is one of the highest, tallest parts of this. Uh, so at parts, it's even lower these days. 
Okay, so the Roman bath in bath. And if you're wondering, hmm, why is bath called bath? Because of this. So <laughs> this was a spa town built by the Romans. Um, this looks great, isn't it, doesn't it? Majestic, Roman, classical. Take a closer look. Do you see anything strange? Our students don't tell the others. <laughs> it will be visi more visible on your own computer at home. But if you look at this part and this part, do you see the color is different? This is like dark and rough and so on, and this isn't. That's the Roman part. This is, the rest is 19th century. So, you know, it's beautiful, it's just 80% fake. Uh, but, uh, if you actually go there, and you're thinking, shall I go or shall I not? And if you only want to see authentic Roman things, there is more authentic Roman here than, than just the bottom of the columns, because the um, bath actually had underground and lower floor parts which are pretty well preserved, so you can see stuff, but yeah. Now the rest, which was, which is above the Roman level, now it's relatively authentic, but who knows? The problem is that this reconstruction was made in the 19th century. In the 19th century, our idea of um, architectural preservation didn't really exist yet. So what they did is that they obviously knew uh, the Roman architectural manuals. So they knew what kind of columns existed, uh, how they would finish those columns. So they knew about the technology, they knew that the columns should stand here, and then, um, they use their imagination to finish the rest, plus those manuals. So it's like, you know. These days, they probably would take fewer artistic, cases of artistic license reconstructing it, but you know, the 19th century was already long enough, so nobody is going to change this. Um, okay, and now, as you can see, suddenly we have a completely different color scheme. This is because this is an earlier presentation of mine, <laughs> which I just added to the end of the other one, so sorry for that. This PowerPoint was created roughly 12 years earlier than the one that I used so far. So, um, and now, let's move to later periods, but before we do that, I present to you another periodization of the same. The one that we had before was based on our textbook and was mostly from the perspective of history. This is more from the perspective of art history. Uh, and here we are basically talking about the pre-Roman period, so everything before the Romans. The Roman period, everything when the Romans were in Britain. And then we could call it the post-Roman period, but instead of that, they divided that to two parts. Um, the early Anglo-Saxon period and late Anglo-Saxon period. So when the Normans were not yet here, that's why Anglo-Saxon. Um, but in fact, they divided it into two, two parts. And the reason for that is that if you don't call it early Anglo-Saxon, but you call it migration period, then it already tells you what that period is about. So after the Romans left, there were some more invaders because Britain tends to be invaded. And those were the Anglo-Saxons. And um, 
the period when they were still coming and more and more of them were coming and capturing bigger and bigger parts of the, the country or the islands, no country there. Um, that is the part which we call the migration period. And then when the Anglo-Saxons already settled down and had their kingdoms, there were more of them, um, then we call that the late Anglo-Saxon period. Now in the early Anglo-Saxon period, we have two types of, ma two major types of art, migration art and insular art. Now this sounds very fancy, but it's very simple. Migration art, anything made by the conquerors and brought with them. And the insular art, anything made by those who were already on the island and were being conquered. So basically those who sort of remained from the, you know, like the, the inhabitants of the island. Okay. So. Um, you might have an interesting question if you paid attention. We said that the Romans left more or less all of them in 419 and the first wave of the Anglo-Saxons arrived around 450. Um, so why do we have up there from around 600 to around 900. Well, the reason is that, um, first of all, they didn't just come in 450 in one big wave, attacked everybody, settled down, and that was the end of the story. It took them a long time, actually, to settle down and um, establish various kingdoms. It took a lot of fighting, it took a lot of effort. And also, while you are fighting a war, you are probably not making pottery. So the first period was more about battles and less about um, manufacturing beautiful things. Um, another thing that you might actually find interesting is that, okay, we are saying around 600 to around 900 in England, and around 600 to around 1200 in Ireland. Any guesses why it lasted longer in Ireland? Just guesses, you know, you can say anything, any kind of wild theory. No wild theories about the Irish? Anybody studying geography, maybe? No? What is Ireland? An island. And okay, Britain is mostly islands too, but it's not the same island. So it lasted longer in Ireland because it took longer to the Normans to actually get to Ireland <laughs> than they took them to get uh, to the rest of Britain, of the British Isles. So, you know, if you are even more in the north, even more to the uh, far, more in the ocean, and you are sort of small and not that interesting, then it might take a longer time for the conquerors to go there. Um, okay, so, what we have from this period is mostly in the form of the fusion of a symbolism of Irish monastic Christianity. And you will read a lot in the textbook about what is the difference between the Irish version of Christianity in the period and the Roman version of Christianity in the period. And there will even be some big fights about this. So um, 
Anyway, so the symbolism used by Irish Christian art influenced also the rest of the, uh, rest of the British Isles and appeared outside Christian art as well. And another important form of art in the period is in the form of decorative metalwork. Um, and what we can also say is that whatever we find from this period are a few objects, a few surviving things, which however are extremely beautiful and very virtuosic. But there are not that many of them. And probably the reason is that while the Romans were urban, the Anglo-Saxons were rural, so they were more settled outside the cities. They didn't build big cities. They didn't have this kind of heavily structured and organized culture, but more like this kind of um, rural lifestyle. So they didn't have big villas to keep their huge amounts of belongings in. Um, okay, so what kind of things can we find in the period? Well, we have surviving illuminated manuscripts. Um, now, what is an illuminated manuscript? Any guesses again? What does it mean to illuminate? You probably heard the word. Don't be afraid to say what you think. It might sound stupid, but it's the correct answer. To illuminate means to shed light on something, right? It's like, good, but what is it? <laughs> because that sounds like a manuscript and a candle above shedding light on it. No, that's not what they mean. Uh, to shed light also has a metaphorical meaning. To shed light on something as an idiom means, of course, to explain something. So an illuminated manuscript is a manuscript where there is not only text, but also pictures which explain what is written in the text. So we are basically talking about beautiful handwritten codices is what we are talking about. Um, so let's show you a few examples. Like the Book of Kells, it is the most famous um, illuminated manuscript from uh, the British Isles, actually. Now, what we have there are the four Gospels of the New Testament in Latin, not in English. Why do you think that it's not in English? There are more reasons than one. Come on. You can sleep later. Tell me something about, <laughs> about why do you think a religious book in the ninth century was written in Latin? No, they didn't come later. They came, as we know, the fifth century, but... Okay, so why isn't it in Celtic then? And as I said, there are many reasons. So like, okay, but good points, good points. Any other things to add? Yes, so one of the things is that the language of the church until very, 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 very late, much later than this, was actually Latin everywhere. Um, until at least Luther was able to convince that it's not a good idea to talk about, to have a, a mass in a language that the people don't understand. So um, 
that's one of the reasons. Another reason is that there is not, not such a thing as English at this period yet. It could have been in some Celtic language, you're right, if Celtic languages were already written in this period, which were not. And that is the thing with the Anglo-Saxons as well, by the way. The Anglo-Saxons couldn't read and write at all. They had good weapons, they knew about feudalism, but they didn't really write in their, definitely not in their own language. So uh, it had to be in Latin, there was no other option. Um, okay, so 340 pages, handwritten, illustrations in almost all pages. Really beautiful, I will show you some closer details as well. So, you know, very intricate patterns of knot work, you know, this Irish typical. So the monks worked a lot on this. Another such case is the Lindisfarne Gospels. It's the second most famous illuminated manuscript from the period also in Latin, also containing only the four Gospels of the New Testament. And here, however, clever scholars who deal with illuminated manuscripts have realized that unlike in the previous book, um, they actually have the same style of writing throughout, completely unchanged. So they think that this was, unlike the Book of Kells, not a collective work of several monks, but probably the lifetime work of one monk, one scribe. Um, and the most accepted theory, that this was probably Saint Edfrith, the Bishop of Lindisfarne. And while this was also in Latin, this was the book that they used much later in the 10th century to create the first Old English translation of uh, the four Gospels. Yep. Okay, so something else, the Tara Bruges. What is a brush in Czech? Yes, exactly. Almost the same thing. Brush, brush, that's just, you know. Um, now, what do you use these days a brush for? Just for decoration. Now, in that period, mostly they didn't use it just for decoration. They used it as a pin to actually keep their clothes together. But this one, was just for decoration already at that point, because although it is not pure gold, it's actually gilt silver with some gold, silver, copper, amber, and glass for decoration, it is still too fragile, too intricate for actually keeping the kind of clothes that they were wore in the period together without breaking. So this was added as decoration. And see, the closer we get to the present day, that is the more written sources we have, the less likely it is that the archaeologists will say ritual purposes. Okay, so now the late Anglo-Saxon art, so the period when the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms already settled in Britain, is still very much remembered for illuminated manuscripts, but we are not going to talk about those. It's more than enough for you to know about two illuminated manuscripts. Um, but we already have, from the late Anglo-Saxon period, surviving buildings, and also ivory carvings and metalwork, but I'm not going to bore you with that either. But I want to talk about embroidery. What is embroidery? In Czech it would be Vishivani. And 
For some reason, um, the Anglo-Saxon embroiderers were extremely popular and famous in the period, so this was a main export article of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in the period. Um, and their special style of embroidery even had a name, Opus Anglicanum, or the Anglo work, uh, which they were looking for worked at all kinds of royal courts throughout Europe. And then, I'm not, I haven't brought any examples of this, but I am going to talk about this one, the Bayeux Tapestry, which is the most famous piece of Anglo-Saxon embroidery, although not in, the, in this style. Has anyone heard of the Bayeux Tapestry already? You did, of course, but... Okay, don't you find the name a bit strange? Does Bayeux sound very English? It sounds what? French, right? Um, now, however, the Bayeux Tapestry probably was made on the territory of England and only later went to France. And the reason it's called the Bayeux Tapestry is because they found it in Bayeux. That's another thing that they found relatively late. It was in the cathedral of Bayeux every year they exhibited it. And once there were some, some English scholars who happened to be around and they were like, oh, this looks like the Battle of Hastings? The Norman Conquest? Why is this here? And then the Bayeux Tapestry got famous. So, 50 centimeters times 70 meters. So half a meter times 70 meters. This is huge. Uh, even showing it, you need some special place. And it actually shows the history of the Norman invasion. Um, and some people say this is the earliest known comic strip. And I will show you why. This is why. There are some examples from um, the Bayeux Tapestry. So as you can see, the whole story is told in pictures, and the pictures come after each other, and there is some text, not much, a bit of text next to the pictures. So it's like a comic strip, right? <laughs> um, by the way, even if you haven't heard of the Bayeux Tapestry, there is a slight chance that you have met the memes and the meme generator for the Bayeux Tapestry, because it is possible to find a meme generator on the internet. You can use all parts of the Bayeux Tapestry, all the people, all the types of ships and weapons, and you can create your own story or love letter or whatever you want in Bayeux Tapestry style. Um, so this actually tells the story of how the Normans conquered um, Britain. The problem is, while it is detailed, it is something that was ordered by the Normans. So it's a bit biased, you know. So obviously the Anglo-Saxons look completely stupid and lame and all that. So it's not completely objective, but it's not. Another thing I would like to point out is if you look at the, that part of the top, on the left, oh sorry, the right hand corner, you see something weird above the tower. Do you see that? And it says next to it, Stella. Now it's not a very early mention of the Belgian beer, nor is it the character from the streetcar named Desire, but in Latin, Stella means star. But what is next to the word Stella is not really a star, or at least we wouldn't call it a star. In that period, they actually called it a star. That's a comet. And that is very interesting because um, 
astronomers, of course, can calculate exactly when Halley's Comet is near the Earth and when we can see it. It's a returning comet, it keeps coming. And they calculated that indeed, during the Norman Conquest, Halley's Comet was just passing by. So it's quite something that <laughs> actually even the comet passing on the sky found its way uh, to the biotapestry. So biased maybe, but detailed for sure. Um, yes, also I would like to point out, it's one of the last things, that I'm getting old, and not only I'm getting old, but this presentation is getting old as well, because as examples of contemporary popular culture, I'm telling you about Shrek 3, The Simpsons, and Diablo 2. Not so contemporary anymore, but the point is, the bio-tapestry appears in all of these. It's not that surprising about The Simpsons, because everything is in The Simpsons, uh, but it is a bit more surprising about the other two. Okay, so we've managed to finish on time, so see you next week. We will continue from here if possible.